Good morning, YouTube. Welcome to the Reptile Barn. Very excited for today's video. It's pretty simple. Just going to talk about um. Eastern Indigo Snakes. Uh, this is George. He is our uh, about year and a half old male Eastern Indigo Snake. And today, I'm just going to do a little bit of educating about this amazing species. So, these are a colubrid. Uh, just like corn snakes, garter snakes, lots of the more common um, North American snakes uh, that you guys have you know, seen and run into probably outside. Uh, but these are a very large colubrid, right? The genus Drymarchon that they belong to. This is Drymarchon cooperi. Drymarchons are big. Those are the Kribos, right? So there's the Eastern Indigo, the Texas Indigo, Yellowtail Kribo, Blacktail Kribo. Um, these are these are big snakes, you know, they can really get to, you know, eight feet uh, quite frequently. So it's not a small little corn snake or something like that. But they're very friendly, not biters at all. Uh, I've heard that their bite is gnarly, <laughs> but I've never been bit. They've never even pretended to try and bite me. Uh, very, very, very good uh, handling snake. Very, they're, they're known as an intelligent species. Uh, I, I think it's kind of hard to judge the species of an animal in general, but certainly snakes. Uh, but anyways, very good handling animal, very confident, very confident species, which I think might be why they don't bite very much. Um, in the nature, right now, they live in Florida, uh, southern Florida. They used to spread over more of uh, the deep south, Georgia, Alabama, uh, but... They um, aren't doing well in the wild. They are a federally protected species. They're listed as threatened currently. And uh, there's some reasons for that. Some, some pretty uh, interesting ecology that went into the uh, threatened status of this species. So um, real briefly, I don't want to get too crazy deep into that, but I think that the conservation side of things is pretty interesting. The eastern indigo snake, through much of its former range, was almost completely reliant on the presence of gopher tortoise burrows. Because um, these snakes do not brumate. So during the cold winter months, which even in the deep south, gets cold enough that reptiles need to kind of slow down, especially if you're not talking, you know, southern Florida, but the other parts of their range do get cold sometimes, but they don't brumate, meaning they don't go into what some of you guys might think of as hibernation, right? It's different with a reptile, but basically just think of hibernation, um, where uh, their systems slow down, they're not eating, um, they just kind of are waiting out the cold, right? So instead they need there to be plenty of gopher tortoise burrows because the gopher tortoises will burrow six or eight or ten feet almost straight down into the ground, right? Where it stays uh, much warmer at night um, just from the geothermal energy. So the eastern indigos will be out and about, you know, hunting during the day when it, the sun's warming them up, and then they need to find a tortoise burrow at night. Um, but... As gopher tortoises got more and more rare, so did these guys. Uh, and eastern indigos have very, very large ranges. Uh, the males, I've heard them compared to like a, a lion on the savanna where they just, they roam for dozens of miles as their natural home range. And uh, they're using that for hunting, for uh, finding mates. They act more like a like an apex predator than like a typical reptile that is kind of a bottom of the food chain kind of thing. Um, part of that is because they get very large, they're very confident, they're very fast, they're very powerful predators, so that in their own right they are able to function kind of like an apex predator, but also the deep south doesn't have a whole lot of apex predators. Um, a bird of prey will certainly take uh, at least young eastern indigos, um, if they're in the water, uh, I'm sure an alligator <laughs> could easily eat one of these guys. I'm not sure if they really would, but they could. 
Uh, other than that, wild boar might eat them a little bit. I know you don't think of pigs as a predator, but definitely pigs could eat one of these. But there's just not that much. They don't really have wolves. Um, they don't really have uh, a lot of bears down there. So so the eastern indigos are kind of an apex predator in their range. Um, now, while talking about the conservation side of things, if they relied on the gopher tortoises and the gopher tortoises started to go downhill, why did the gopher tortoises start to go downhill? Short answer to that is that the gopher tortoises need longleaf pine forests. They need a very specific kind of forest that lets a lot of light through the canopy to hit the ground so that the shrubs and sedges and things that the tortoises eat can grow. If you uh, have the wrong kind of forest where the ground is really dark, not a lot grows on the ground and the gopher tortoises don't have any food, right? So, long story short, people altered, not on purpose, but they altered the type of forest that could grow in the natural range of the gopher tortoise and therefore the eastern indigo snake. They did this with the fire regime. Um, basically, people don't like there to be fires all the time. So we send out our crews and we suppress the fires, right? But the longleaf pine forests could only compete with the other types of trees if there were frequent fires coming through, right? Um, the natural succession of the land, if there's not fires very frequently, other trees encroach on the longleaf pine forests and kind of take over. Uh, and then the gopher tortoises go downhill, and very quickly, these guys go downhill. So it's kind of a very, to me, fascinating uh, series of events that caused the downfall of the eastern indigo in much of its range. Um, I think a lot of people want to blame the pet trade. Uh, before they were listed as threatened, I'm sure there were plenty of them that were being taken out of the wild, uh, just like lots of species are. Um, however, in this case, the science is pretty sound. When we stopped letting the fire regime be frequent, the longleaf pine trees were outcompeted, and then the gopher tortoises didn't have enough food, and without the gopher tortoise burrows, the eastern indigos didn't have anywhere to go at night during the cold, and they were kind of forced into the southern extremity of their range, which is southern Florida, where it just doesn't get that cold, right? So, that's kind of the, the history a little bit of this particular species. Um, they eat anything. As far as the care of these guys, wow, their feed response is terrific. <laughs> they eat anything they can fit down their mouths, right? Um, I've heard of people giving them amphibians. I give them fish. Uh, they'll eat birds. They will eat rodents, obviously. I give them a lot of rodents. Um, they love snakes. Uh, I have heard that if you take an egg and crack it, they'll even eat out the egg from inside the raw egg. Uh, so they, they like to eat and they are not that picky. Uh, that being said, those of you who have followed our vlog know that I overdid it one day. I don't know, it's been a couple months, I think, maybe a month or two. Um, but uh, they're, while they'll eat anything... Apparently, the volume that they eat should not be in huge meals. It needs to be smaller meals closer together. And uh, you can go back and, and watch the vlogs if you want. But basically, as they're growing, I was you know trying to increase the amount of food I was giving them. And I just increased it too much. And they both regurgitated on me. And I was very nervous. Regurgitation is not good for a snake. But they did okay. Uh, another interesting fact while feeding them. They do not have the gape of most snakes where you know most snakes can open their mouth incredibly wide to swallow things that you would never imagine they could swallow i mean they are a snake they can open their mouth very wide but it's definitely not as wide as most snakes can open their mouth so you have to feed them in much smaller pieces as well as the overall volume not being super high um uh so they eat so quickly compared to many snakes. I mean, I can just give them a piece and they'll kind of do the, you know, the back and forth mouth thing, just rah, 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 um, really fast. So I can, you know, if I'm giving him fish, I can chop it up into pieces, give him a piece, he swallows it down, give him another piece, he swallows it down. It doesn't take that long. 
but uh, it is something to be aware of uh, if you're going to keep this species that uh, one, you got to give it to them in small pieces, and two, they're one of those snakes that definitely could use smaller meals closer together rather than you know some of the large pythons that want a huge meal once every two or three or four weeks, right? So uh, that's something that I learned the hard way, but uh, they're okay. They've recovered just fine. Uh, they've gotten back to eating normally, pooping normally. They're doing great. Um, what else? So breeding these guys, uh, they definitely do need a cool down period. Uh, reduce the uh, photo period as well. So make it so that the day doesn't last as long with the lights on, you know. Um, and uh, they are egg layers, like most colubrids. They... Uh, because they're snake eaters, got to kind of watch them, right? I've heard that it's good if both snakes are about the same size that you're breeding because uh, you just don't want one to get intimidated by the other one thinking that it's going to get eaten, right? And uh, they typically will lay, you know, I think the average is probably six eggs. Um, but uh, you can't breed them nearly as early as like the ball pythons, for example. Most of my ball pythons, when the males are a year old, they're ready to breed. When the females are two and a half or so, they're ready to breed. Some of them take you know a year longer than that or so. These guys, it's more like four years or five years or even six years before they're really, really ready to go uh, and breed. So uh, it's a bit more of a long-term investment. But I didn't really get these guys as investment. I got them because they're awesome. <laughs> uh, to obtain one, um, there are breeders. There's fantastic breeders. I've I've uh, raved on the vlog before about Vic Herrick. That's who we got ours from. He is fantastic, awesome guy. I recommend him to anyone out there who wants an Eastern Indigo snake. Uh, be aware that if you are not in the same state as the breeder, you will have to get a federal permit because they are federally regulated as a threatened species. It's like a hundred bucks. It's not terribly expensive to get the permit, but it takes a few months. You gotta fill out a bunch of paperwork, get a letter of recommendation or with, with some information from the breeder. Uh, the government just wants to know how many of these guys are out there being shipped across state lines. Uh, it's their way of regulating. I don't think it's a very effective way, but that's what they do, so we gotta do it. And that's fine. So just be aware of that. If you can find a breeder in your state, that's the best way. So, you know, if you're in California, for example, I know there's a bunch of breeders of these guys there that produce a lot of Eastern Indigos, then you're in luck. Uh, if you're in, you know, North Dakota or Alaska, <laughs> then you have to get one from out of state and it's going to take you a little while. So do your, do your uh, research and make your plans because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a process. But I think it's well worth it. These are stunningly beautiful animals. Um... I got a pair of red throats from Vic. They're not related, but uh, well, not not very related. I don't I don't know how many truly unrelated Eastern Indigos there are out there because there's just so few of them in captivity, uh, relatively speaking. But uh, you can get them in just jet black or with this uh, red throat. I like the red throats the best, so that's what I got. But you can get them in just pure black too, so it kind of looks like a gigantic Mexican black king or something like that. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else to, to tell you about them. Um, they don't need to brumate like we talked about. I know some people who breed, you know, corn snakes, king snakes, that kind of thing. They kind of have to shut them down for a few months in the winter and don't get to pull them out and play with them. But uh, these guys, not necessary. You can uh, keep them up all winter long and they do fine, although many of them will go off feed or feed very infrequently during the coldest part of the winter. Um, and that's okay. Uh, they, they know what they need. Um, yeah. So if you have any questions about this species, um, I would love to try to answer them as, as well as I can. Um, if you uh, are interested more in the conservation side of things, I know I got, I got into that a little bit, but, uh, there's a whole lot to learn about the conservation of this species, the Orion Society. I'll, in fact, I'm going to put a link in the description to the Orion Society. Fantastic group that works on reptile conservation in the United States mostly. Um, they, they have done a ton for this species in particular. Um, 
I know that they have begun a reintroduction into the Konica Forest. Uh, that's a national forest in, I want to say, Alabama, uh, which was part of their ancestral range, but they had, you know, died out from there. And so they uh, have been reintroducing them there, uh, doing a lot of really good work with reptiles. So they would be someone to look up and uh, support and uh, share their work. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I may uh, ask Vic if I can leave a link to his info. So any of you looking to buy any of these guys soon, uh, have an awesome breeder to buy from. He is, uh, honestly, guys, so good. I know, I, I've said this before on the vlog. I hope you're not getting tired of it, but he was just the best to work with. Um, and that's saying a lot, because I've worked with some incredible breeders for the animals that I have purchased. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed looking at this incredibly beautiful snake here. Uh, I, I feel like I always pull him out when I do videos with these guys. Uh, like seems to always happen to me, Ursula, the female, is in shed. I promise I have her. She exists. <laughs> um, she's beautiful. She's a great handling snake as well, but she's in shed right now, so I'm leaving her alone. Uh, she seems to be growing faster than him, too. And if I'm not mistaken, the males of this species are supposed to get bigger than the female, so he's got to catch up. But that's okay. Uh, he's eating well, so I'm not worried about it. He'll get there when he gets there. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, we're the Reptile Barn.